Thanks, uh, Hakan, for the introduction. And also thanks, everybody, for bearing with me in this last talk today after uh, yesterday's conference dinner. Um, and thanks to the organizers, of course, for inviting me. It's a pleasure and honor to be here again at the ESI. So everything I'm going to talk about is um, based on joint work with uh, Ryan Unger uh, from Princeton University. And uh, this talk will be about general relativity, but I think it, there are actually lots of um, aspects which also are interesting for other uh, equations. Um, so uh, in general relativity, as we have seen already, but I will reintroduce it again, the main objective is to study solutions, uh, space times, um, of the Einstein equations, which on the left-hand side have uh, the Einstein tensor, the famous Einstein tensor on the right-hand side is the energy momentum tensors, which um, captures the matter content contained in the space-time. And personally, the beautiful thing about Einstein's equation that you can couple it to various matter models in, in classical physics, and we have seen this throughout this conference already. Uh, in my talk today, I will actually look at three or four matter models, namely, depending whether uh, you count vacuum as a matter model, and then we on the Einstein-Maxwell-Schwarz scale of field system, uh, which we've already seen, and the Ma einstein maxwell vlasov system spherical symmetry, and also the Einstein-Maxwell-Null-Dust system and spherical symmetry. And, um, there's also a certain way in which those approximate each other, and some of these approximations will also feature in the talk. And maybe lastly, also about vacuum, I mean, the interesting thing about the Einstein equations is actually that in vacuum compared to Newtonian gravity, it's already non-trivial, and the non-trivial degrees of freedom are called gravitational waves. Okay, so in vacuum, the Einstein equation reduced to uh, reach equal to zero, and the most elementary solution, the trivial solution after uh, Lorentzian geometry's model is the Minkowski solution uh, with its geometry called special relativity. And, uh, well, this is the flat metric. Of course, we know it all. And then some, uh, I will also introduce this diagram, which relativists uh, like a lot. At least I would like it a lot. This is called the Penrose diagram. And let me briefly explain, even though Zong Jin already explained it a little bit. So we should, uh, so this is a two-dimensional diagram of four-dimensional space-time. So you actually quotient out by the uh, SO3 action, if you want. So uh, in the sense, you should think that time is going upwards and the radius of the spheres are going to the right. Okay. So to the left, we don't go because we don't have negative radius. And then moreover, it's uh, depicted on a compact domain. So this is actually a compactification of the infinite space. And the compactification is chosen in a way in order to... Uh, 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 to respect the uh, conformal structure. So it's a conformal compactification such that these, these uh, light counts still lie at 45 degrees. Okay? And that is why it makes it, is it so useful to convey information in general relativity. And so this is sort of uh, I plus, so where the V coordinate, which is T plus R goes to infinity. And this is I minus where uh, T minus R goes to minus infinity. Um, so now, we talk about, uh, I want to introduce the concept of a black hole, and for this uh, to make sense, we have to talk about asymptotically flat space -time. So these are space -times which asymptotically look like Minkowski space. So uh, the metric G approaches that a suitable rate Minkowski space, and, um, and if you have such a space -time, then you can define a black hole as namely the points in the space -time where any ray originating, any, um, uh, any causal curve, originating from that ray cannot reach that far away region. So this is just a way of defining it. And the event horizon is just a topological boundary of that subset of the space-time. And sort of it's important already, I think, to notice that the, the definition of, the very definition of a black hole is something uh, which, you, uh, which is a teleological notion in the sense that you can only locate the black hole exactly and particularly also the event horizon once you have solved for the full future. Okay. Only once you know what I plus is, so you know the infinite future, then you know exactly where the black hole is. Okay. But in an, an analogy to Hawking's result, which uh, we heard in a previous talk, which uh, was about the Big Bang singularities, Penrose's incompleteness result is about black hole incompleteness. And the, morally, that's sort of important for the purpose of our talk, is namely that, that if a space-time contains 
a trapped surface so that the future mean curvatures are both uh, negative. So it's a true surface, so they're two future mean curvatures. If both of them are negative, then necessarily, according to Penrose's incompleteness theorem, um, that sphere has to be in a black hole region. So you should think that the trapped surface is a sufficient condition for having a black hole or being in a black hole region, but not a necessary condition. Okay, so this is uh, something to take away. Okay, so the most famous solutions, uh, apart from the Minkowski space of the Einstein vacuum equation is the Schwarzschild geometry, which I have depicted here now with the Penrose diagram and locally given through this uh, uh, expression of the metric. And this describes a, um, an eternal black hole with mass M and black hole region are less than or equal to M. The interesting fact about the uh, Schwarzschild solution is that actually it has two asymptotically flat ends here and here, but we will only be concerned with the upper part here, okay? And the black hole region is here because if you look at the path of this faraway region, null infinity, then this is this region and the complement is actually this region. And that's the black hole region. So going back to the concept of these trapped surfaces, so this is spherically symmetric space system. So let's look at the spheres of symmetry as our surfaces. And in fact, the black hole interior is foliated by the trapped spheres. And the exterior, there is no trapped sphere necessarily. Um, we can also think about uh, the Schwarzschild solution as arising from two-ended complete initial data as a solution to the Cauchy problem. But this is, these data are a bit strange because they have topology R cos S2. But if you think about formation of black holes, which I will like to address, then actually the topology of the initial data better be R3. Okay. So this is why actually the Schwarzschild solution, as depicted here, the maximum extended Schwarzschild solution does not um, describe the formation of a black hole. The formation of a black hole is better described by the uh, um, Oppenheimer-Snyder collapse so with the Penrose diagram like here, where you actually have a fluid which collapse under their own gravitational uh, force uh, to, a, to a black hole solution. And this actually can be realized from Cauchy data, which are diffeomorphic to R3. And nevertheless, the Schwarzschild solution is very relevant because in fact, the, the future development of an incomplete hypersurface signal like this, so this darker shaded region, that region actually is isometric, ah, the wrong direction, to this part here, okay? So even though that, even though the full Schwarzschild solution is not the, the one actually which describes gravitational collapse, part of the space time are very much important for understanding gravitational collapse. So this will be a recurring theme now as well. So another solution, uh, uh, in this case, Einstein Maxwell system is the, uh, the so called Rice and Nordstrom family. And this is the two parameter family solutions, which are parameterized by charge E and mass M. Penrose diagram now is much more complicated. I'm not going to explain all the details here. Um, again, you have, except that again, you have this asymptotically flat region there, and then you have an event horizon there. So here we don't care. But then you also have the black hole region. And actually, the interesting thing is that you have this Cauchy horizon. And Sung Jin already mentioned the strong cosmic censorship is conjecture is concerned with the stability of this. But this will not be necessarily, this will not be the content of this talk. So again, you can think of the, uh, uh, the, the, the solution arising from two ended data like this. And then you'll get the darker shaded region here. But you can also look at actually incomplete data as I did before for the Schwarzschild solution. And, the, the, uh, and there you're actually allowed to also go inside the black hole. And all those fears are physically relevant for gravitational collapse as long as you don't go too far in. In fact, all of them has, have no negative Hawking mass, which is a necessary condition um, for being able to arise from regular initial data on R3. Okay. So in terms of trapped surfaces, now we have something interesting that namely here, they're untrapped surfaces, they're uh, trapped surfaces again, but actually further inside the surfaces become untrapped again. And this is something which will be important. Okay, so now the extremal case is when actually the parameter E equals to M and both of them are non-zero. Then uh, the solution looks like this. So this is now called extremal rise and Nordstrom. And this will be actually the space time 
uh, or like parts of the space, some which will be important later for the talk. Um, now, again, uh, it looks like this. We have the, uh, the exterior of the black hole and then the black hole region right there. And again, you can either look at data rising from complete initial data like this, or you can look some incomplete uh, space like hypersurface and then look at the future of this. And again, if you don't go too far in, then actually this everything here can arise in gravitational collapse on R3. But here, something now interesting also occurs, is that namely, you have trapped surfaces outside, then you have a marginally, then you have this event horizon here, which is foliated by marginally trapped spheres, but in the interior, there are no trapped surfaces. But in fact, this is a black hole, an eternal black hole, but this is a black hole without trapped surfaces. So, the, again, this is now an example of why having a trapped surface is a um, sufficient, but not a necessary condition to have a black hole region. So now we uh, go to the scary part. If you're, uh, if you're sort of an observer living on I+, like all of we are. In, in fact, the, the so-called super extreme horizon Nordstrom family. So this is, a, this is a, also a solution of the Einstein-Maxwell uh, system. And it's a non, it does not contain a black hole, because if you look at the, if you look at the past of uh, null infinity, then this is the whole space time. With the backward slide cone. But actually what it contains, it, it, it contains an eternal naked singularity at r equals zero. So r equals zero is in fact, a, um, it's a singular point, it's a singularity. Um, so actually this is, uh, has also the, the existence of this has also caused a lot of confusion in the history and I hope that some of our work actually can be seen that this shouldn't be disregarded, this space time. And in fact, already from the perspective I just talked about, it should not be disregarded, but if you, if you already take a hypersurface uh, like this, where again, you don't go too close to r equals zero to that naked singularity, then all of those spheres have non naked talking mass and in fact can arise in gravitational collapse. In fact, we have a theorem that all of those, that, that, that this part of the space time can in fact arise in gravitational collapse. So you should not, only because part of the space time is uh, isometric to a super extreme horizon Nordstrom, you should not uh, disregard those space time as unphysical. In fact, they do occur. Okay. So, okay. So now we have talked, we have introduced this Ryzen Monstrum family. Um, uh, I want to now uh, introduce a black hole thermodynamics. So, this is something which was put forward by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking. And this is a very influential paper from 1973 in which they. Um, postulate that black holes can be assigned a temperature. More precisely, in terms of the mass charge and specific angular momentum. In the talk, we now don't care about angular momentum, because this is all in spherical symmetry, and maybe at the end we will talk about angular momentum. So this is the temperature. In fact, it, it, it is proportional, according to black hole thermodynamics, to the surface gravity of the black hole. So sub extreme black holes, when, e is, uh, when the charge is less than m, they have positive temperature. And extreme black holes is exactly when m is equal to, well, now it's q or e, I'm sorry, I use q and e interchangeably, um, they have uh, temperature equal to zero. And black hole thermodynamics is now nowadays a basic uh, topic in graduate courses in general relativity. And in, in fact, in those paper, they introduce four laws and the, uh, in, a, in analogy with the classical laws of, of thermodynamics. And those laws have been proved uh, the first, uh, the C, C, the C, 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 the C, the C zeroth law, which says that the temperature is constant along a stationary horizon. The first, the second law that have been proved by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking and Walton, uh, suitably interpreted. Uh, the third law has a different uh, status, and so recall that the third law of classical thermodynamics states that a temperature cannot reach absolute C, C, absolute uh, C, 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 absolute C, C, absolute C, C, zero Kelvin. In analogy, uh, actually, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking postulate that, or conjecture that a positive temperature, a sub extreme black hole cannot cool down to an absolute zero temperature black hole in finite time by any continuous process, no matter how idealized. And some of those extreme black holes, which I've introduced uh, before, they should be only seen as, a, as an ideal limit, but not actually something which you can attain in gravitational collapse. And uh, together with Ryan, we proved uh, two years ago that there exists a precisely defined process in which a sub-extremal black hole becomes 
extremely finite time, evolving from regular initial data in the Einstein Maxwell chart scale of field system. So in particular, the third law of thermodynamics is false. And the analogy uh, between classical thermodynamics and, and uh, black hole thermodynamics is not as perfect as uh, Dean Carter and Hawking had uh, conjectured. Um, so this is proved in the Einstein Maxwell chart scale of field system. So in this model, we have a Lorentzian manifold, we have electromagnetism and a complex chart scale of field, which the Einstein equation, the Maxwell's equation, and then the propagation equation, the wave equation for the scale of field. Um, I will very briefly explain what we do. We, we sort of, with a, we, we, we impose fine-tuned Cauchy data on R3 of the einstein maxwell chart scale of field, uh, which undergo gravitational collapse. And first, they form a sub-extremal. In our case, we actually make it a Schwarzschild, a parent horizon here. And then later, an exactly Reisenotstrom, extremal Reisenotstrom uh, event horizon appears. And we can make this arbitrarily regular. So for each k, there exists a CK example. And our, uh, this proof uses a technique called the characteristic gluing. And one of the features of this is that actually this outermost apparent horizon now for the expert, there is some discontinuity here. And this discontinuity is actually crucial in the construction of counterexamples to the third law. And in fact, there has been. Um, this is something um, yeah, which I would like to address, and uh, I would like to stress, and if some people are interested, I can explain more than that. But in fact, this is all I wanted to say about the proof, because I wanted to actually explain something else, which I will come back now. So while sort of this result disproves the third law, it actually shows that extreme black holes do occur in gravitational collapse, and, and, and one should certainly attain their existence, and in fact, <coughs> I want to now convince you that, in fact, they take a very central role in the in gravitational collapse. And to do this, I uh, I'd like to flash this overview paper of uh, Carsten and uh, Martin Garcia on the critical phenomena in gra gravitational collapse. So, critical phenomena and uh, the understanding the threshold between dispersive and black hole solutions. This is something which has been uh, and a lot of investigation in, uh, in, in general relativity, but also for many other equations. And it's, a, in my opinion, a very interesting field, but also very difficult. So how, what does one do? So now we draw a cartoon picture of the moduli space of initial data or the moduli space of solutions, which you, uh, which you would like to understand. And sort of understanding the black hole formation threshold is a, is a central problem in GL called critical collapse. So you should think that there's, uh, so you have this moduli space of all initial data or all solutions, depending on uh, how you want to call it. And uh, so we have Minkowski space in the middle, which is nothing in there. And then, of course, we know that around Minkowski space, which is stable, um, there's an open ball of dispersive solutions, which disperse back to Minkowski space uh, to the future. And uh, so we have this whole region of dispersive solutions. And then we also have sub-extremal, uh, uh, we, we, have, we have also black hole solutions, which we also know how to construct. And understanding the black hole formation threshold is sort of an interesting, um, yeah, and what happens at that threshold, that's uh, the problem of uh, critical collapse. So I should be maybe, depending on what matter model I, I look at, maybe I don't want to call it necessarily dispersive solution or maybe also geodesically complete solution if you also want to allow stars and so on. Um, so how does one typically study this? One looks at so-called interpolating families. So these are families of initial data or of solutions in the Einstein equation coupled to certain matter models, which interpolate from Minkowski space to, some, uh, to a black hole formation. And then you run your parameter in your family, and at some point you hit a critical value, and you would like to understand what is that critical object. So there are very famous numerics by Job uh, in the spherically symmetric Einstein scale of field model which predicted that at that threshold, there should be a naked singularity. There has been lots of work also by Carson. Many people uh, have confirmed and, uh, sort of this prediction um, for, uh, in, in different contexts as well. So if you allow for uh, matter models, for instance, einstein klein gordon or uh, einstein Vlasov models, there has been also observed that certain star-like or star-like objects, stationary solutions, live on that threshold. And uh, so these are all numerical works, and it's a fundamental and, and 
I think, very interesting open problem to make any of those uh, numerics rigorous. And in fact, you can also entertain those questions for, e for different the dispersive equation. I think it's exactly also a very interesting problem and a very difficult problem. So um, let me now introduce another theorem. And for this theorem, we're going to uh, consider a self-gravitation charged plasma. So this is a solution to the Einstein-Maxwell-Vlasov system. In my opinion, also a very pretty uh, set of equations. So you have the Einstein equation coupled to the Maxwell's equation here, and then also to the Vlasov matter. And the Vlasov matter is a model by a distribution function on the mass shell, which is a subset of the, the tension bundle. And you just say that along the electromagnetic geodesic spray or geodesic semi-spray, F is, in, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is conserved. Okay, so this just means that the characteristics, or like that F is constant, distribution function is constant along um, uh, the, the electromagnetic geodesic spray, okay. uh, along the flow lines of the electromagnetic geodesic spray. So this is just the, if you want, the, uh, the equation obeyed by a test particle uh, which is charged and where the background is, uh, is, is also charged. So this is the Lorentz force. And um, yeah, and sort of that loss of matter, in fact, sources both the uh, electromagnetic field strength tension through the Maxwell's equation and also the Einstein equations. And so the theorem uh, we have put on the archive with Ryan Unger is that uh, there exists a smooth one parameter family of solutions. And the critical, so this runs from, so it's a smooth one parameter family of smooth solutions were uh, running from lambda equal to zero to lambda equal to one, and the critical value lambda star between zero and one, such that if lambda is smaller than lambda star, the solution disperses Minkowski space and no black hole forms. If lambda is equal to zero, you're isometric to Minkowski. If uh, lambda is equal to lambda star and extremal black hole forms, and if lambda is bigger than lambda star, a sub-extremal black hole form. So we showed that there exist extremal black holes on the black hole formation threshold. And uh, yeah, so we call this extremal critical collapse. Okay. Um, so back to the picture. So what we show is that um, there exists a different way of leaving from Minkowski space to a sub-extremal black hole. And this is actually sort of a different direction than what was, a, what was studied in the numerics literature where on the black hole formation threshold, you have an extremal black hole. Let me maybe say here that, in fact, the only black hole you could ever have on the black hole formation threshold is, in fact, an extremal black hole, because sub-extremal black holes have trapped surfaces. And once you have a trapped surface, as Hans already said, uh, well, but I will say no, but an, in, a, an, an, in analogy what Hans said, actually having a trapped surface is a stable condition. So if you have a trapped surface in your space time, there exists an open neighborhood in moduli space for which you necessarily also have a black hole. So if you have a black hole, it, it, it can, on the threshold, it cannot have trapped surfaces. So actually, these extremal black holes are, in that sense, natural candidates. And I think one should, uh, maybe the numeric, yeah, OK. Um, OK, so, so this is what we proved. So now I would like to show the Penrose diagram of the construction, which hopefully illustrates somehow some of the aspects. So the qualitative picture is that we fire uh, lots of beams, or beams of fire beams of lots of matter from infinity towards the center. So this is here is sort of from past infinity, from past infinity. So now it looks a bit strange on this uh, uh, on this compactification. So you should uh, while sort of you you might think that this lots of beam which comes from sort of negative time infinity comes from r equals to zero. In fact, it comes from r equals infinity. And it only looks strange because of the conformal compactification. So the infimum of the support, uh, the, the infimum of the support, uh, the uh, sorry, the infimum of the radius of the support of the blast of matter goes to plus infinity as you go here. Okay. So these are blasts of matter coming in from infinity, and they come in from infinity, and then they have to follow electromagnetic geodesics. And in fact, there are two mechanisms. 
for repulsion of such geodesics. And then the one is due to angular momentum, and the second one is due to charge repulsion. And we exploit both of them to make the incoming Vlasov beam uh, bounce at some sort of in the bulk of the space side, and then go off to infinity and again. And by fine tuning our, uh, our Vlasov beams, we can achieve that as lambda is less than lambda star, you have full dispersion. And in fact, as you get close to the critical value, the exterior of the beam, which has to be isometric to a member of this, the rise and Nordstrom family, is in fact isometric to uh, the super extremal rise and Nordstrom. So even though your exterior is super extremal, there's no naked singularity in here. Okay. As you approach the critical value, lambda equal to lambda star, in fact, at some point, uh, yeah, uh, as you approach it, exactly as you have it, in extremal black hole forms, and here we have an event horizon. And as you tune lambda a bit more than lambda star, you have a sub-extremal black hole, and then you have a sort of a subset of trapped, a non-empty subset of tra trapped surfaces. Um, so I should also say, if you prefer uh, the initial data on R3, in fact, you can realize this as smooth initial data on a hypersurface, which sort of goes from there to there. And those initial data are actually is, is a smooth one-parameter family of smooth initial data. So everything is in the same infinity topology. I mean, the data cannot be small because you are forming a black hole. So in that sense, okay, it's not small. It, it, I mean, that's sort of <coughs> understanding this critical threshold is ne necessarily never a small data problem. It's always a large data problem. So these are theorems, mathematical theorems. So these are rigorous theorems. So, so I think it would be, uh, I think it would be natural, and I think personally, I think it's interesting also to uh, numerically uh, check this. Yeah, and I, I, I'm sure that can be checked. You mean, you mean also here? So the Raishaduri equations tell you that once you have a trapped surface sphere here, you have it to the right, but not to the left. And so in, in particular here, we prove that uh, this part is not trapped, that this, they're not trapped surfaces. In fact, one, our construction, and now that you mention it, sort of a big part of our construction is understanding this, this repulsion of the beam when it becomes from ingoing to being outbound going. And in that region, we force everything to be in the regular region, not to have trapped surfaces. And in fact, if you want, that part is isometric. And uh, okay. let's see if there's a lot of uh, slides, many slides. So that part is sort of isometric to this part here. Uh, to this part here, let's say, for instance. So our construction is in spherical symmetry, that's correct. The Vlasov beam is not spherically symmetric because it has to be a smooth distribution on the tangent uh, bundle. So it cannot be spherically symmetric. So it has angular momentum, but uh, the uh, velocity averages are then spherically symmetric in order to be able to close with the Anthony closure. Okay, so that's where we were. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about the proof. So, in fact, we put our Cauchy data, in fact, near the bounce region. So I've been telling you that we have we can put the Cauchy data far out here, but in fact, actually, how we do it, we put our Cauchy data there. That's where we start our construction, okay. because that's the most difficult part. So that's where we go, and we make also our data locally uh, totally geodesic, in particular if you want, in other words, time symmetric, local time symmetric, and this allows us sort of its well, it allows us to estimate both the coming to the bounds and going from the bounds away sort of at once. It's not necessary, it makes the proof simpler. And sort of putting our data exactly where the bounds happens, this gives us sort of direct control of how we want the bounds to happen. So because our, uh, so this is sort of where the bounds happens here. 
that's where we put our data. So this is a totally geodesic hypersurface. And now you should think that we flip this also to the past, and then we get the full uh, picture here. Okay. So in fact, the only thing we are concerned about is actually sort of that region here. So we can go to the future, but also to the past. Um, and we look at sort of three different regions, namely the near bounds region here, where we actually have to show that the particles which become ingoing go outgoing again. So this is the near bounds region, and that's which we actually have to sort of carefully control the geodesic flow. And we do a sort of phase based support estimates of F. Then the far region, it's uh, sort of uh, uh, from there far away. So in that region, uh, we use energy estimates to call the, uh, control the geometry. You sort of you, you cannot use other, you cannot control f, the distribution function in L infinity in that region, which you typically, I mean, if you prove sort of stability type results of, of I mean, stability of Minkowski space, for instance, for the einstein vlasov system, you often estimate the distribution function in L infinity, but necessarily this does not work in our in our hierarchy, and that is why. Uh, so sort of we have to rely on energy estimates. And then the third part where we actually want to get to the sharp dispersive rates we use, um, well, we exploit sort of the geodesic deviation. That is a more standard uh, thing to do. Class of type equation. So let's focus on the bounce region because that's the most interesting one. So in the bounce region, we actually have two main beams. And those two beams, beams in fact, exploit the two mechanisms of repulsion, namely angular momentum and charge repulsion. And first, we send in sort of a weak beam of size eta. And that beam bounces due to angular momentum repulsion, because the angular momentum of that beam sort of we make of large size. The, uh, but sort of in general, it's a small beam. There's a, the, the L infinity norm of F is small, but the angular momentum is large. And in that region, in fact, the Lorentz force can be neglected. And in fact, you cannot even exploit anything because in the sort of in the in the first beam close to the center there's no charge so you don't have any repulsive mechanism from the charge so quantitatively we uh, sort of we, we we bootstrap that the geometry and the electromagnetic flow is close to the one of minkowski space and this allows us to sort of uh, control this weak beam uh, which bounces due to angular momentum the caveat however is that the mass which you inject would be much larger uh, than the charge. And this has to do with the fact that the mass sort of uh, is sourced by the energy momentum tensor, with, uh, which has quadratic weights of F, and the charge is sourced by the uh, particle flux, which has, uh, a li which has, a, li which has a li which has a which has a linear weight in F. And if you have large angular momentum, then in fact the quadratic weights is always much bigger than the than the li than the li than the, li than the, li than the li linear weight. And this uh, necessarily makes the case that sort of the mass, both of them are small, but the mass you inject is much, much bigger than the charge. And remember, for an extremely black hole to form, you actually want the mass and charge to be of the size, the same size. Okay. So this beam is, uh, will, uh, will not be, uh, you can never use sort of that type of beam in order to create an extremely black hole. So this is the first beam, it's the first beam. And the second beam, actually is, uh, is a strong beam, and it bounces due to charge repulsion. So that will be of size 1. It has very small angular momentum, and I'll explain in a second why this is good. And however, having very small angular momentum, in fact, requires a singular ansatz, quantitatively singular ansatz for the distribution function. In fact, the distribution function is, is sort of in our, in the small parameter epsilon, sort of almost approximates the derivative of a delta function. Uh, however, the singular ansatz makes, well, okay, it makes standard norms like the F infinity not useful, but it brings up the space times in, to, extremali to extremality in the, in the regular region. And that is exactly what, uh, sort of, to answer uh, Arsene's question. Actually, this happens all in the regular region, and this is sort of uh, important for us. And moreover, if you look at the geodesic flow equation in, in certain coordinates, Sort of in the UV coordinates, then you see as, uh, if you put make L very small for the geodesic flow, then you can completely cross out this part. So this is gone, and uh, the change of the momentum actually is li linear in in this term. And you know that Q is now lower bounded by 
as by the first beam by eta, and you exploit, in fact, this uh, to show that actually PV is growing that PV is growing linearly due to the repulsion of the charge. And by going to very small angle momentum, you kill the part which comes from the geometry where you don't have control over. So if we have a certain hierarchy of scales, it's more complicated than this, but what I want to talk about is, is sort of that we have this hierarchy of scales that we have the, the mass has to be very small, the epsilon has to be much smaller, and then eta is the weak limit also has to be small. Okay, but now I have still haven't told you how we set up the data, but sort of what's the heuristic mechanism of those two beams. And uh, but before I tell you how, to do the, how we set up the data, I have to make a small detour, I'm afraid. But actually, I think it's an interesting detour because what we also prove is that in that hierarchy of scales we have, eta, epsilon, m, as we send all of them having suitable ratios to zero, in fact, our one-parameter family of solutions converges in a certain weak start topology to a, a solution of the Einstein charge null dust system. And this is something you sort of, which you should always think that the monokinetic limit of Vlasov and last of you have a distribution of the velocities at the point, and if you sort of make the collapse the, the distribution of the velocities to one point, then you should get the fluid. And in this case, that's uh, that's what you get. I mean, a solution to the Einstein charge null dust system, which is here. So the Einstein charge null dust system is not a well is not a well posed system. And uh, in fact, but one can give an explicit singular solution to that system in terms of the ingoing charge vidya solution and some free functions uh, omega. So it's not well posed, but you can actually explicitly write down uh, uh, solutions of that system in terms of the vidya metric. And uh, this is what I've depicted here. So, the, yeah. so I don't want to go into details here, but somehow what I want to say is that you should think that actually there's an ingoing fluid which is, which, which is ingoing with velocity k, and at some point, something interesting happens, namely that this r is decreasing here. In fact, uh, you remember that q and q dot are both positive. As r is increasing, uh, yeah, uh, as r is decreasing, I'm sorry, decreasing, this term becomes bigger and bigger, and at some point, k actually becomes equal to zero. Okay. So the fluid can stop. The fluid velocity can stop, and that's... Actually, one of the reasons why, if you look at the, this can now not happen for the geodesic equation, but for the, uh, for the Lorentz force equation, this is something which can happen because it's, a, it's actually not this a spray, the somehow spray. Okay, so at that bounce radius, in fact, if you continue just having the solution, sort of this, the energy momentum tensor violates the null energy condition as as uh, r is smaller than r b and. So Ori's interpretation was that once, okay, the ingoing fluid, fluid trajectory hits that bounce radius, it has to change direction from ingoing to outgoing in a sort of discontinuous manner. Um, uh, but this, of course, is then, this will then be a free boundary problem. So let's look at two examples of what could happen. Uh, in general, sort of, okay, so you have the fluid which is incoming here, and let's assume now that all of the fluid particles uh, have the property that this hypersurface R equals are bounds the space like, then you are in good shape because then um, you can actually continue the, the ingoing solution with an outgoing solution here without ever looking at the region where ingoing and outgoing particles meet. So if it was time like, or in general, if it had no causal uh, character, then it's a much more problem. And okay, this is a sort of, you don't know what to do. So if this hypersurface sigma b is space-like, then an explicit surgery procedure uh, with an outgoing vidya solution is possible such that the, from the second fundamental form is continuous. However, the solution is still very singular, namely that the uh, rho, the energy density, is not an L infinity. The, the, the particle current is not uh, continuous because it uh, bounces off. And in fact, also sort of this, uh, you cannot, I mean, it's a teleological assumption somehow, right, that the, the bounce hypersurface is space-like. You cannot read it off from the initial data. Um, nevertheless, sort of, now I'm sort of, uh, we prove, in fact, that there is a way of, uh, of prescribing this, the, those free functions in Ori's model. In fact, we, we don't prescribe it in, uh, in, in that model. 
but we directly, again, we prescribe the geometry of the bounce hypersurface here, and you can do it by solving a certain system of uh, nonlinear ODEs and differential inequalities to obtain, in fact, that there is a regular space lag and totally geodesic bounds. And in fact, our construction uh, starts with this construction. And uh, so now we come to the, how we choose the initial data. The initial data for <laughs> the einstein maxwell vlasov can actually be seen as desingularized data from this singular construction. Even though our proof is logically completely independent of this, uh, you, morally you should think that, I mean, and that's what we did, that we solved first this singular problem first, and then used our knowledge about how to solve the system of ODEs in that bounds region to desingularize it. Unfortunately, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but, um, but the knowledge of the existence of extreme critical collapse for this uh, null, uh, charge null dust model was only psychologically. It, it did not help us with the quantitative estimates, I know you. So with desingularizing solutions, uh, it's, uh, yeah, and, and sort of controlling them, the smooth solution uh, was very difficult, so we had to sort of do it uh, independently. Um, nevertheless, so if in a weak star topology, you, you're converging to this. And maybe I should say that in this solution, actually, you only have one beam. Because uh, you should think that the traditional dust solution approximates uh, or converges to a delta function of L at the origin, so you cannot actually bounce you to um, angular momentum. So here, the bounce happens only due to the charge. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. They're gone, yeah. They're gone, yeah. They're, they're gone. So it's a bit funny. I mean, that's an interesting thing about that. It's a very singular space term. So on the one hand, you might think that the innermost beam here, right, that actually only sees no charge because it, uh, because it's uh, in the interior there's, uh, uh, here in the interior there's Minkowski, so the innermost beam has no repulsive mechanism. But actually it's sort of a very singular matter model. And, and, and even though there is this innermost, uh, trajectory, it still sees uh, electromagnetic uh, repulsion. And this has to do with the, just the singularity of uh, the matter model. In fact, this matter model is singular along that, uh, so, so at the innermost beam, in fact, rho is not, an L, it's not even an L infinity. So and that's why we only converge in a very weak limit. And this is also the reason why, why you cannot use information of that, except for uh, maybe psychological information you can use, but not any quantitative information about this picture for the Vlasov picture, because the conversion is so weak. But essentially, the inner beam goes away then. But also, you have to set up, of course, these function uh, omega and, and q, which are free functions. You have They solve this system of ODEs. So you have to actually set up them correctly. Okay, so finally, now we want to formulate a conjecture, which some people have, uh, some people believe, uh, but I know that Carson is more critical about this, uh, is that actually this is a stable phenomenon. So what I mean by this is that um, if we perturb our curve, which we had before here, so this is the curve we constructed, but if we actually perturb this curve, then again, once you hit the black hole formation threshold, again, there should be an asymptotically extremal black holes arising on that black hole formation threshold. Um, so this is also a non-trivial statement about the interior of black holes. And also there's a further difficulty which arises, namely the so-called Aritakis instability associated to extremal horizon. So extremal black holes are difficult uh, also in terms of decay. 
And there are many open problems of how fast do even solutions to the wave equation decay on, on uh, extremal black holes. In particular, uh, on extremal curve, it is not even known whether solution to the wave equation decay or not, or even are bounded. So this is an open problem. And this has to do with uh, further instabilities uh, associated to extremal horizons. Nevertheless, you might expect or maybe hopeful that some weak form of, inst uh, of stability is still true, which is weaker than for sub-extremal black holes. Um, yeah, far less is known in vacuum, and even the third law of black hole thermodynamics has not been disproved restricted to vacuum, so we also conjecture that there exists Cauchy data for the Einstein vacuum equations, so necessarily this is outside of spherical symmetry, which form an exactly Schwarzschild apparent horizon only for the space time to form an exactly extremal curve horizon uh, at a later advanced time, particularly already in vacuum, the third law is false. So in vacuum, we have a result that if you give me parameters, angle momentum A and M, which have the property that A divided by M is much smaller than one, then in fact, you can cook up Cauchy data, which actually could collapse to, a, to the exterior and, uh, of a curved black hole with those prescribed parameters A divided by M much smaller than one. And the goal would be actually to make this not much smaller than one, but less or equal to one. And in principle, however, also the extremal critical collapse and the revised picture of modular space uh, can be conjectured to also hold true in vacuum and uh, uh, with extremal rise and Nordstrom replaced by extremal curve. But this is a very difficult and open problem and also relates, of course, to understanding the co-dimensional stability and stability, uh, co-dimension one, uh, co-dimension stability and stability of extremal and near extremal black holes and the nonlinear ramifications of horizon instabilities associated to uh, extremal horizons. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.